Hi, this is Nicole Rivera, and you are listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. It's June 9th, 2022, and according to my Every Day is a Holiday calendar, today is Writer's Rights Day. So I figured that this would be a great opportunity to talk about some basic rights that all writers should know about and what to do when you get sort of into the bog of beyond and talking about things you don't know about. I'll begin by just reminding everyone that I am not a legal expert. I'm simply just doing some research here and using that plus my personal experience to share what I know and anything that really comes down to the nitty gritty of what's going to be best for you. Always make sure that you seek out professional advice before you make any solid decisions. Um, But there are some things that are just sort of very beginner writer's rights that we should all know about when it comes to getting our work out into the world. Uh, so you're, you've been writing all your stuff, you have everything either on your computer, your notebooks, what have you. That's not really, if, if that's as far as your writing goes, writer's rights aren't necessarily a consideration for you. It's when you want to publish your work when you want to get out into the world and start publishing and that is as early as putting it on the internet you have to start thinking about what does it mean when my words go out into the world uh so let's talk about it let's talk about just the basics and like i said i'll i'll direct you to some resources where you can go for more in-depth uh questions and answers and advice The first thing that comes to mind when talking about the rights of writers' work or um, their writing is this whole idea of a copyright. And I do remember one of the first times that I was in a panel um, and somebody asked agent or a publisher, you know, should I copyright my work? before submitting it and I was sitting in the audience saying like I never even thought about that why would you want to do that and you know I broke into a conversation with some other writers that were there and and basically it was this like whole fear that the agents or editors or whoever you were submitting your work to would um, take your idea and run with it and you would have no course of action against them if you didn't have your work copyrighted. Uh, That sort of blew my mind. And the advice at the time was, um, you don't have to do that. We're all professionals, right? Like that's kind of how it was. But let's talk about the legality or at least like what we know about copyright. So the second you write down your work on a computer, you draft it, you own it. It is yours. So that is kind of how the copyright law works. In fact, the, the um, oh, I just had it here. Did I just lose it? Here we go. If you go to um, the FAQ page on copyright.gov, it reads, your work is under copyright protection the moment it is created and fixed in a tangible form that is perceptible either directly or with the aid of a machine or a device. So, I mean, if you read that, that means that every single time you do a draft, you, you that's yours, that's yours, that's yours, you have the copyright. Um, so it's sort of done, except how do you, you know, protect that in, in a court of law? Um, yeah, I'm, again, I said at the top, I'm not a legal professional. So... Could you still copyright your work? You could. It's going to cost you some money. It might make you feel better to have a copyright. Um, but one of the the key distinctions to remember when you talk about a copyright is that it you can't copyright an idea. As far as I know, you cannot copyright an idea. So what you could do is get a copyright for a draft Oh, you know, for a particular manuscript, for a particular story, poem, whatever it is that you've written. Um, But again, by law, you had that anyway. So um, it really just comes down to 
would it make you feel better to have it? You know, it might make it easier if you say, well, I already have the copyright and here it is, uh, rather than pulling out your computer and showing the files and the dates on them and saying, you know, clearly this is my, my copyright. Um, so the simple answer of do what you need to copyright your work before submitting is no, you really don't. Um, unless it would make you feel better. So beyond the general, I own my work once I write it, once we step out into the world, and again, as I said at the top, this includes the moment we get onto the internet and start posting our work, then, then we're starting to get into conversations of who am I sharing the rights with? You know, who am I giving rights to my work and which rights am I giving to my work? And, you know, these days there's all this talk uh, about uh, we, we hear the conversations about movie rights and about television rights and about, uh, you know, uh, audio rights and foreign foreign printings and things like that. It's it's a little bit more uh, in the vernacular than it was, you know maybe a couple of decades ago where we didn't we were like will the book ever be a movie and we didn't really know that this in involved some big uh legality behind it and so with that being in the conversation of popular culture it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to know that there are multiple rights that can be discussed when it comes to your writing and that's where I think all of this stuff gets crazy overwhelming, right? Because um, if you've ever even looked at a little bit of a book contract, it's just like, oh, no, no, no. Like when you're talk <laughs> talking about a book contract, I, I would say make sure you have an agent, somebody whose job it is to just read those things. But when we talk about smaller um, steps into the publishing world, like publishing a short story and submitting it to, uh, you know, different journals or online spaces. These two have different rights that are being um, discussed and shared, and you got to be careful. So I want to just begin with like two things that are sort of like um, major like warnings, right? So like I said, there are many, many rights to your work, but there are cases where you give away all your rights and then that's it. That means you wrote it, you handed it over to whoever, and you it's not yours anymore. It is not yours anymore. That is not your story. <laughs> they may put your name on it, but you can't do anything with it. You couldn't um, even publish it on your own website or anything. It's theirs now. And that is if you see the term, I mean, it's pretty clear, all rights. If you are signing over all rights to your work, that is exactly what it sounds like. It's kind of like the one, one of the articles that I was reading called it one and done. You write it and you're done with it. That's it. That's it. It's over. You have that one sale and you're done with it. So that's all rights. And, um, and another way that you can give away all rights is if you do a work for hire. So those are two, um, sort of key terms to keep in mind when looking for, uh, the, the, Oh my goodness. The conditions of your submission. Are you signing over all rights to your work? Is this a work for hire situation? Um, in those cases, you're, that's it. You're one and done. And maybe a work for hire is, you know, you're writing about something you're not really interested in anyway. You see this cool job uh, that'll have you writing. They'll give you some money um, and you're writing about basket weaving for um for a blog and you don't care if you don't own that article that's fine right but if it's a work for hire and it is a piece of work that you do feel attached to and you want to um lay claim to um that's probably not the venue you want to work with so those are two that i just wanted to start off with because i feel like um 
this has happened in certain writing contests that have come around. Uh, the all rights thing pops up in the fine print. And I just want to make sure that two things. One, writers are reading the fine print, particularly when it comes to these contests, um, but also that you recognize the terms um, that are going to take your stories from you. <laughs> like, that's really like, like you're taking my baby. So that's, uh, those are two that, you know, there are, there's a time and place where they work for writers, but if you are concerned with losing the rights to your work, those are two terms that I would, I would keep in, um, your back pocket and knowing that these are like red flags. You don't necessarily want to submit to those spaces if you want to keep the rights, any rights to your work. Now, taking a step way back from that and talking about what's the smallest piece of rights that you could sell um, and still own your work, you know, in every other way, is the very, very common first serial rights or if you're here in the US or Canada the first North American serial rights uh, which is often abbreviated uh, FNASR so it seems like this is an acronym that people are just supposed to know <laughs> so if you see FNASR we're talking about the for first North American serial rights and that's just basically um, selling your story or poem or article or what have you uh, to a periodical for the first time it's not been anywhere else and this is why you know we're always talking about like be careful about putting your stuff on a blog, uh, a personal blog, because that's it for many of these spaces. The second you, um, publish your piece on even your own personal blog, even if you have two readers, it doesn't matter if it's out there, you can't sell this. You can't sell the first serial rights. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, places will look for just that type of um, work and oftentimes it'll be you know a better pay than second right so uh, you want to be careful with with that kind of thing but once once you sell that first right there's that understanding um, for for many pu uh, publications that that's all they have they just have the first rights and then you get to do whatever you want with it after that now, notice I said periodicals because there is actually a different designation for first electronic rights. And then, depending on the space or place you're submitting to, that might even be different than first internet or first online rights. Do you hear already how convoluted and crazy this is getting? So this is why it is important to know and have a basic understanding of what is going on out here, but also be comfortable with asking questions. If there is something in uh, a contract that you're just not familiar with, or you're not sure what it covers, there's really no reason that you shouldn't be able to ask, you know, uh, before submitting before submitting or before um agreeing to the 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 contract itself of course so when you see first electronic rights that would be a much broader situation than the first serial rights because the first serial rights are in a print form your work goes out into that that one let's call it journal right um and it's printed and it's that one issue and that's that when it's the electronic rights this could include i mean it's a little bit of a throwback but this is what's written in the law cd roms audiobooks those types of situations or depending on how you know the company you're working with uses the term it could include internet and online which could also include emails so 
there's, like I said, there's no uh, shame in asking for specifics when somebody says electronic rights and you say, well, what does that mean exactly? Um, and so with the first rights, you still contain a lot of rights yourself, right? You, for the first serial rights, I should say, because you have freedom to do with the work, whatever you want after it's in that periodical. With the electronic, it really does depend whether or not they're talking about the full internet um, or just, you know, some electronic transmission. And I'll, I'll have a number of resources in the show notes for you to get a little bit clearer on the delineations that are widely understood. Although, again, it could be, uh, there could be interpretations within the publications. But yeah, I've, I've got an article here from Writer's Digest, which I, I found very useful. Writer's World, Writer's Write. Uh, I think there's even one from Cornell um, Publishing, just to have a taste of like one company's sort of interpretation. But my purpose in this episode is pretty much just to give you an overview of understanding that there are so many different rights to be discussed and you do need to be reading these things carefully when you are getting into the submission game. Clearly, after we talk about first rights, what would come next would be the second rights to your work. And that is what uh, many people sort of get stuck with after they've publish their work online not knowing that that would count as first rights Uh, and that does very often limit where you can submit but also changes the contract changes oftentimes the pay however another term for them just so we are clear on this is the reprint rights so these are also this is a, a right that you have to resell a piece So if you had taken advantage of the first serial rights and sold your piece to a periodical and it went out, the second serial rights can also be used for that piece, right? So it's not only, I don't want to make it sound like this is, oh, uh, if you're selling second serial rights, that means you, you, you weren't paying attention in the beginning. No, you could, you could actually sell your first rights and then sell your second rights and make you know this is this is what I'm talking about this is where your your piece of writing could become a constant breadwinner being sold over and over again and this is why um, we don't want to get caught in selling all rights at the beginning because look at that you've already if you sold all rights you've already lost these two opportunities and then there's more to come there's so many different ways that you can sell your work over and over again this still does not even touch the tip of the iceberg of all of the other rights that are still to be sold to own to have uh, when it comes to your writing other things, other terms that, you know, you need to educate yourself on are things like the one-time rights, the anthology rights, excerpt rights, which is pretty cool as a former educator. <laughs> I nerded out on these. Uh, that's, you know, basically if you want to sell excerpts of your stories to be used in places for example, like educational materials, where oftentimes uh, we don't get a complete story. I'm, I'm thinking back to the New York State Regents exams, where there's always like an excerpt of some story for uh, the students to read in the English exam. Um, yeah, that is somebody sold excerpt rights to their work in order to be used in that space. So that's another a whole nother place um, that you can sell. There's archive rights. So definitely, um, take a look at the show notes today for sure. And, and also continue to do this research and understand that every single one of these terms has their own set of rules, has their own, um, benefits, right? Some are, you're getting a wider exposure, but maybe, uh, you don't get to do much with your work afterwards. Um, some, you know, you may be getting paid a little bit more, 
but maybe it's not as wide of an exposure depending on the periodical. Again, every single contract is um, its own entity, but knowing your rights going into this is pivotal. It's, it's, it's for anyone who's looking to get paid for their writing. This is not something to be overlooked. This is part of the work. It may be the most important part of the work once you get to the point of submission. You really need to understand what you're signing away each time you um, submit your piece of writing. Um, you know, I don't want you to lose any story that could potentially be a breadwinner for you over and over again. So what do you do when you're getting bogged down, when you're, this is just too overwhelming and you want to get out there and start submitting and uh, you're just learning about rights? Well, I, you know my first bit of advice. It's going to be stop writing alone. Just get connected with other writers that are in the process that are maybe a couple of steps ahead of you and ask them, what they've done get into the conversation of what are some of the things that you've learned about and you've um, discovered along the way what are some of the things i should look out for do you know of a reputable journal that or uh you know literary space that would like my type of writing these are things that come naturally when you're writing with other writers you start talking about where they've been published what they liked about them how they work together um that's number one. Number one, very simple. Um, yeah, that's like picking off the lowest hanging, the lowest, lowest hanging fruit, right? Is just hang out with writers that are doing what you're doing. Have the conversations, not just about craft, not just about, uh, you know, getting the writing done and, you know, and not getting the writing done and all the things that writers tend to talk about when they're together. But talk about the serious stuff. Talk about the legalities, the rights, um, the pay, all of those types of things, the work of it all. Uh, number two, there are, and this is a, the, the larger umbrella of Stop Writing Alone, there are many writing organizations that, um, you know, provide legal help. Sometimes it's just a space to ask questions and they have professionals answering questions. Sometimes it is actually providing lawyers to, um, to help you in contractual deals. Um, and that's, you know, the first one that comes to mind is always Authors Guild when it comes to that. I'll put their link in the show notes so you can see um, what they have on their, their legal page. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, I, it's why when I've ever thought about publishing, I've always felt like, oh, I would need an agent <laughs> because it's like one of those jobs that it does feel like this is a thing that I will not know all the right things. An agent's job is specifically this, to go through all these contracts. This is what they know. They know all of the different things and they can be your translator. This is particularly when we're talking about, um, you know, publishing, uh, books, novel length pieces, um, Agents don't normally take on short story writers, although I do feel like I've I've heard there might be a change in that. Um, but again, it's it's a very small pay, so it doesn't necessarily make sense for an agent to to pick up somebody who's, who's a short story writer. Um, but maybe you'll find one, right? But an agent is really a, that's their job. That is their job. So you've got. Stop writing alone. Find your people that are in the trenches with you and ask them the serious questions. You've got organizations like Writers, um, I'm sorry, Authors Guild. Um, and then you have the professionals whose job it is to actually do this for you, This your, your teammate in the publication process. So don't forget that that is what an agent is for. It's not just, I do think there are some um, beginner writers that feel like the agent is there to find a home for your writing and that is part of the job but to me the value in the agent has always been um that next bit not really finding the home but translating the the legal conversation 
once the home is found, that's that's a real power of having an agent. So don't forget about that if um, if if you have you know if you if you haven't thought of an agent in that way that's what they're there for so that's all with your um writer's rights that's a very very um uh cliff notes version <laughs> of just remembering for on this writer's rights day i just wanted you to remember that there's a lot to think about when it comes to your rights and your writing uh, today's the perfect day to think about it, to reflect upon it, to do a little bit of research, particularly if you are getting ready to submit. Do not skip this step. Make sure you read what rights you are giving away when you pick a publication uh, and make sure you're okay with that. It is okay to walk away from a publication that is super excited about your work if they are not going to give you um, the rights that you feel you deserve or want at this time. There's no shame in that game at all. So happy Writer's Rights Day. I don't know why that's so difficult for me to say. Writer's Rights Day. And um, yeah, I'll talk to you next week. I did, it, at the top of this episode, I did mention that the, it is June 9, 2022. Um, this is just in case any of these rights or anything change over the course of time. I want to make sure that... If you're listening to this at some time far in the future, always double check. Whenever you're talking about any type of legality or things of that nature, um, check the dates of your resources and make sure that they are up to date. But have a wonderful week. Happy writing. And I will talk to you next Thursday.